the cost of fuel was outstripping any kind of profit that they could get from their mine. At that time, the power source, coal, bringing that in to power the power plant was becoming impossible. Mine owners were constantly losing money trying to bring new and more powerful sources of energy to their mines. They had to do something to save the mining industry in the Telluride area. Reaching these mines was difficult enough, but then when you factor in the challenge of bringing electricity to these mines, it becomes a whole new ballgame. All these separate pieces existed. The money existed, the idea existed, the need existed. But what happened in 1891 was all of that came together. It's hugely historical for mankind. Colorado Experience is made in partnership with History Colorado. Inspiring generations to find wonder and meaning in our past and to engage in creating a better Colorado. HistoryColorado.org With funding provided by the University of Denver, celebrating 150 years. The Denver Public Library. The Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. Telluride was located in a very remote part of Colorado on the slopes of the San Juan Mountains, uh, really the, one of the last sets of mountains for miners to explore and develop. The San Juans were owned by the Ute Indian tribe and it wasn't until the Bruneau Agreement of 1873 was that region opened up to mineral prospectors and by 1875 prospectors were finding rich deposits of gold and silver in the district. Telluride actually came about in 1878 as a brand new town that usurped an earlier community called San Miguel that lay about a mile to the west. But Telluride was closer to the mines, it was better laid out. And Telluride began to boom as a gold and silver producing town. Telluride was a loud, smelly, <laughs> dirty place to be. It was a boom town. People came there to make money, to sell their wares either as merchants or as bankers, uh, but it was a very temporary place to be. They essentially relied on things like arc lighting and, and kerosene lamps for light, which were extremely Hazardous, I mean a lot of fires attributed to that, very smelly type of, of emissions from these. And no sanitation. Um, you had the society part of town where if you were a family or a, a member of society you would have your home. And on the other side of town you would have the industrial area where you would keep horses and you would receive raw materials and the red light district. It was a very small and isolated town. Eighteen ninety Telluride. If you look at photos, you'll see there's nary a tree in sight. So everything had been cut for building. Everything had been cut for fuel. So you didn't have a lot of that as a as a resource for energy for the big mining operations. So what they used instead was coal. Coal was a principal way to power the machinery, the boilers you needed to operate the drills underground. The saying in the mining camps was, "It takes a mine to make a mine." You need capital in order to buy your machinery and to hire your labor and certainly to generate the immense amount of energy it takes to literally pry the stone, the granite, the quartz out of the heart of the mountain and bringing out the process into gold and silver. And this is before the, the railroad came in 1890. So all of that coal had to be shipped in via pack mule, wagon train, and on horse. The landscape was extremely rugged. The San Juan Mountains were volcanically created. They were more prone to erosion that created real steep-sided, cliffy valleys. And as a result, transportation to get from 
a place like Telluride to the mines was a bit difficult. You had to be part mountain goat in order to be a miner in the San Juan Mountains. And, and it was said that most good miners in the San Juans were mostly good mountaineers. Reaching these mines was difficult enough, but then when you factor in the challenge of bringing electricity to these mines, it becomes a whole new ball game. It was an extreme expense to ship all of this energy in, and just as much of an expense and time and energy and manpower to ship all of the ore that they extracted out of the mines out of Telluride to be processed. You can only really make money on it after it's been processed. So it was a very lucrative business, but it was also a very risky business. And in fact, by the early 1890s, Telluride's mines were on the verge of shutting down because they simply didn't have enough power sources to electrify the mines, to provide for adequate ventilation, to run the pumps which kept the mines from filling up with water. And unless somebody came forward with a solution, then the mines were simply going to have to shut down. Lucian Lucius Nunn, also known as L.L. Nunn, had a profound impact on Telluride. He came to Telluride after it was a well-known mining town and he came here to make his money, to make his claim. L.L. Nunn was typical of many people that came west. He came to Colorado, first going to Leadville. He owned a tin bathtub and would rent this to the grimy miners on the weekends so they could clean up. So when he was right around 30 years old, he made his way to Telluride. And he was considered kind of an oddball kind of person. He was short, he was five feet, one inch is tall. He admired Napoleon Bonaparte, so he would take on these affectations of imitating Napoleon poses. He did have the sense of grandeur about him. He had this internal knowledge that he would be very successful and uh, very well known. Uh, so he, he always carried himself, even though he wasn't wealthy, he always dressed uh, to the nines. He always had a, a nice pocket watch, the best quality suits. But he was an energetic young man. He astounded people by walking from Telluride to Uray and back to Telluride in one day. He lived in a tent and he existed on a diet of oatmeal. He wanted to be a, a Rockefeller. He wanted to be well known in American society. L.L. Nunn got into banking. He had a little bank called the San Miguel Valley Bank. He had a loan with the Gold King Mining Company. The Gold King's main source of power was coal, but your source of ore is not always steady. And in the case of the Gold King, they started to drop off on their ore production, which meant they weren't keeping up with being able to pay their bills. He recognized that they had to do something to save the, the mining industry in the Telluride area. And so he began to look for alternative sources of, of power. And he was, you know, brave enough to be trying new technology to look for some different alternative in order to keep his mines mills up and running. In the 1890s, America was electrifying. But we hadn't settled on a standard for electrification, and really there were two rival electrical systems that, that were trying to become the, the major system. Thomas Edison with his DC system versus George Westinghouse and his AC system. DC stands for direct current, meaning there's a unidirectional flow of, of electrons. AC stands for alternating current. The electrons are reversing direction many times a, a second. Direct current works well if you're right at the location you need the power. And alternating current works well if you need to send electrical current some distance. It became a, a public issue because Thomas Edison wanted to sell DC power. And he wanted to make that his namesake. Thomas Edison's folks and Thomas Edison himself uh, absolutely believed in direct current and held most of the patents on direct current. When Nikola Tesla first moved to the U.S., one of the jobs he had was working with Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison saw in Nikola Tesla this innovative, 
creative spirit and just amazing capacity to think of new ideas. But one of their areas that they clashed was Nikola Tesla was convinced that AC power was a better source of power. There was nobody ever like Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was as unique as they came. It felt like he was from another time and space and he didn't really belong in the late 19th century. Probably the most gifted, most talented natural electrical engineer that I've ever read about, certainly. He was Serbian born. When he was quite small, he had seen a picture of Niagara Falls and decided that he could harness that, that power. He was a 19th century individual, a Serbian America, born in this Victorian era whose brain lived far in the future. And he was so far out with his theories and his experiments that that he wasn't much of a success. People really couldn't read this guy, Nikola Tesla, because he would come up with experiments about time travel and about communicating with other planets and pocket-sized electrical generators that were portable in a way that we really couldn't get our minds around until this century. But he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant in thinking about ways to create better energy sources for the future. At the time, Edison, you know, was, was saying that this alternating current, this new current, was the death current. Edison's one contribution to alternating current uh, was the invention of the electric chair. So he patented the electric chair because, of course, AC was the death current in his opinion and invited the press and, and uh, others to watch this first execution of a convict. Well, it didn't work out very well. The condemned wouldn't die, and uh, his hair was on fire, and smoke was coming out of his eyes and his ears, and he was moaning, and people ran from there just absolutely mortified at this inhumane way of trying to execute a prisoner. We use the term electrocution now. There was no such term back then. Edison found it convenient to say that the condemned prisoner had been Westinghouse. But on the other hand, Tesla would show people for Westinghouse Corporation that alternating current wasn't necessarily deadly. He could wrap his body with coils of wire that were connected to a rheostat. And with one hand, he would put his hand out towards the rheostat and this big spark of electricity would jump several feet. And in his other hand, he would hold an Edison light bulb that would glow, but he didn't die. So with low voltage, it was, it was perfectly safe. So everybody knew about DC power, but what they did know about Edison was that it was successful. They could use DC power, but it couldn't be transmitted over long distance. So L.O. Nunn was researching different ways to use DC power and came across Westinghouse's technology. And that was where the spark occurred. George Westinghouse was an entrepreneur, an inventor in his own right, and uh, obviously believed very much in the industry and, and alternating current. He made a, a habit of surrounding himself with really talented people. Westinghouse, because he owned several of Tesla's patents, would consult with Tesla regularly. So none serendipitously wired the Westinghouse Corporation and, and got a hold of uh, George Westinghouse, who liked the idea. So a meeting was set up where Nunn would visit company headquarters in Pittsburgh and present his idea to the Westinghouse board. When he did this, the Westinghouse board thought it was a grand idea and they supported it. So Nunn traveled back by train to Telluride thinking that everything was set. But when he arrived in Telluride, George Westinghouse had sent him a telegram saying that the board reconsidered this proposal because they figured the cost was going to be too high. Well, it was disappointing to none, but fortunately, the Gold King hit a new pocket of ore. And he took a train back, and when he walked into the boardroom, he had a big bag it was $20 gold pieces in the amount of $50,000. And he plonks this bag on the table and says, gentlemen, this is what the gold king brings to the table. What will you do? Westinghouse really saw this would be a, an opportunity to offer 
positive proof of the superiority from an economic standpoint of his alternating current system. It impressed George Westinghouse so much that he gave $25,000 of his personal fortune. And by the close of the meeting, the board was convinced and agreed to pursue the project. And so in 1890, L.L. Nunn and George Westinghouse began developing an electrical generation system in the town of Ames, just a little outside of Ophir, Colorado. George Westinghouse worked with Tesla, although Nikola Tesla never actually came to the Ames site. They did communicate by letter, and obviously Westinghouse was using um, the polyphase patent of uh, Nikola Tesla's alternating current. And so it's picked up in three different locations off your generator, and it develops a sine wave, um, a frequency that it operates at, and all the other electricity on the transmission lines has to operate at that same frequency with it. Nunn decided to put the Ames power plant at the southern end of the Ilium Valley because there was a lot of ready water. I mean, there were waterfalls, there were other streams that were rushing down. The production at Ames Hydro starts really up in the watershed above Trout Lake. Um, there's a high altitude reservoir up there, uh, Lake Hope, and that collects some water for us as well, and then it flows down into Trout Lake, which is the larger storage reservoir. From there, at the time in 1891, it went to box flumes, I mean, made out of wood and on trestles. Of course, there were a lot of engineers in the area that had built trestles for all the railway. So there was a lot of help and, uh, and technology available to build these box flumes to deliver water, essentially two and a half miles from Trout Lake down to a vertical steel pipe that then ran down the side of the mountain um, a thousand foot of head and went through the turbine and generated electricity at Ames. When Ames was first built, it was a wooden structure. The generator and the technology and all the wiring uh, was built in a, a two-room wooden shack. In constructing the Ames power plant, none had to rely on other people to build it. And what he was good at was recruiting young college students that were in engineering programs throughout the United States. And L.L. Nunn called them pinheads. And this name came about because these young electrical engineer engineering students came from all over the country. And so in L.L. Nunn's office, he had a giant map of the U.S. And wherever a student would come from, he would pin them on the map. But they were the ones that actually built the power plant under the supervision of Westinghouse engineers and put the power poles up and strung the lines, which were bare copper wire lines. The construction of Ames Hydro uh, it took a little bit more than one year to get the thing built and in place. The transmission line obviously was one of the larger challenges. Um, to hang transmission line from poles going across these mountains in this area was no easy task, so it took some very, uh, very stout people and very dedicated people to run the transmission line to Gold King Mine. The distance between the Ames power plant and the Gold King Mine was approximately three miles. So, um, you know, very rugged country, and so that to run transmission network over that three miles certainly provided some challenges. It wasn't really believed that the technology at Ames would work, that it would be successful. They knew that separated, the technology worked and was sound, but put together in the actual environment with the water pushing that Pelton wheel um, and, and using the generator, they weren't entirely convinced it was gonna work. The technology was so new that it actually was a, a party for the people of Telluride in the area. They would come out knowing that this technology was gonna go online on a Sunday afternoon, and they come out with their picnic lunches and their buggies and, and watch Ames you know, generate the first alternating current electricity. So it was quite an exciting time for them. People on, on horseback were convinced that they would be able to race the electricity from the power plant up to the mine, be able to, to beat that, the flow of electricity. The electricity travels at the, the speed of light, so it was um, <laughs> certainly not something that they were going to be able to achieve. At Ames, you had a large crowd and a smaller crowd up at the Gold King Mine. Nunn, being somewhat of a showman himself, announced what he was going to do. He flipped the switch and sparks flew from one switch to another 
and the electrical current was sent up to the Gold King mine. The electric induction motors there come to life. It's a successful project. Once Nunn's Ames power plant was running, Nunn quickly began the Telluride Power Company and wanted to extend this network throughout the Telluride area. Locally and regionally, it transformed Telluride life and it made Telluride into the crowning jewel of Western Slope mining. One of the first conventions they had to come up with was lightning protection. Go figure that lightning at 10,000 feet can be rather uh, damaging, but they struggled with it and uh, eventually came up with surge protectors that would protect their unit and their equipment so they could continue to generate. You had freezing, you had ice that would build up on the lines. You had avalanches to contend with that could take out the power poles. So they were dealing with that, as well as just dealing with living in the mountains and the wildlife. Um, one of the, the better stories was the, the bull snakes. They had trouble, the bull snakes kept swimming up the tail race where the water came out of the powerhouse and going into the powerhouse because it was warm in there. Well, the pinheads didn't want the snakes in the power plant and decided the best way to eliminate the snakes would be to put metal plates on the floor, wire these to the generator, so when a snake wiggles between two plates, it'll make a contact and be electrocuted. And it worked beautifully. The snake would get in the water and it would electrocute them. And uh, the downside was it would trip the generator off every time they did it as well. So they got rid of that idea and went to screens instead. <laughs> The impact of the Ames hydroelectric power plant was profound. It demonstrated that AC power was safe, that it was reliable, and that it worked, and that I could transmit electrical power long distances. Ames Hydro was absolutely the first generated alternating current, transmitted, used, and sold for industrial purposes in the world. The monthly bill was about $500. And prior to that, the monthly bill for coal was $2,500. This was a huge savings, and it meant other mines in Telluride now wanted to use electrical power. And by 1894, most of the big mines in Telluride were electrified with alternating current power. Successes like at Ames demonstrated that it could be safe, uh, it could be successful, and it could be cheap. It really changed the entire landscape of the United States and, and beyond, and it, it really did start the, the field of electrical engineering power systems. After L.L. Nunn's success here in Telluride, he moved back to Ithaca, New York, to work with his brother at Cornell University and endowed that Telluride Institute that is still financing scholarships uh, and special projects for electrical engineering students today. Introducing an easy and reliable source of electrical power made gold mining all the more affordable. It took out one of the expensive factors of providing coal or providing timber to generate electricity affordably and safely in order to keep ore coming out of the Gold King mine. Cheap, abundant, and safe electricity probably lowered the production cost of the gold and increased the profit margins, which benefited everybody. It allowed them to bring in more miners, more packers to bring things out. It, it increased the production to a point where, where the mine prospered for long past the period where other gold and silver mines were open. After the experiment at Ames proved successful, alternating current power and hydropower exploded across the western United States and across the eastern United States as well, with Niagara Falls following closely behind. Largely because what had happened at Ames, the Niagara commissioners awarded the bid to Westinghouse. So at that point, Edison, I think, was finally willing to, to recognize or acknowledge that the AC system was superior, and at that point, the, the AC-DC conflict is, is said to have concluded. Word traveled fast. They got the word out and uh, the business began building uh, these, these hydro projects and these alternating current generating plants. It exploded in this country and really across the world where, all right, here's this, this new current, it's safe, we can transmit it, we can use it, it's easy to make, and we've been there ever since. So you have this perfect storm of the person, 
the, the time period in American history where this kind of adventure, this capital adventure could take place. You had the natural environment which precipitated that need and you had the technology. Gold and silver were driving everybody and everybody wanted to get rich. It was the business interests that really drove the technology. When they started seeing the, the profitability of their mines disappearing with the cost of bringing fuel in to continue their operation, they were desperate. Westinghouse being willing to take this risk, Tesla leaving the Edison company, partnering up with Westinghouse, them coming together, meeting with L.L. Nunn, and making this power plant happen. By creating this, this new current, it has absolutely changed the course of hum human history. Thanks to L.L. Nunn and his Ames power plant, small mining communities like Telluride were electrified way before some of the major cities in this country. His legacy always will be attached to being the one who helped bring alternating current to mankind. The Ames power plant is still in use today. It's owned by XL Energy, producing 3.75 megawatts of power currently. Tesla's alternating current ultimately became the electricity that powers everything. The television that you're watching right now is powered with alternating current. It serves every function so much that we, we kind of forget it. It fades into the background now how electrified we are. We live in a world in the 21st century that these inventors, Tesla, Westinghouse, none, could only dream of. But the important thing is they dreamed it and it allows us to live here today.